for our call to worship this morning. Would you please join in in the appropriate places? Why are you here today? What brings you to this place? For many of us, it's been a week of challenges and trials. We have all experienced some joy-filled times, sometimes without frustration or anxiety. So why are you here today? What brings you to this place this morning? I'm here because I know there have been times in the past week when I have trusted myself and relied upon my own abilities, times when I have failed to see the hand of God at work in the world. So why are you here? What brings you to this place today? I have come, knowing I stand in the need of grace, seeking God's love and forgiveness, knowing I need to spend time on my knees in prayer, time singing my praises to Him, and time listening to God's voice. I come, knowing this is a place where I can experience the very presence of God. Then welcome, friends, knowing this is God's house, and He is here. May you find what you are longing for, and may God speak to you this day. If you please join me within Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let my foot slip. He who watches over me will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over me. The Lord is my shade at my right hand. The sun will not harm me by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep me from all harm. He will watch over my life. The Lord will watch over my coming and going, both now and forevermore. And our next hymn is Because He Lives.
And that is evident of the Spirit at work within our world. So join me today in prayer. Join me as we lift up our thoughts and our prayers to our Heavenly Father. Almighty God, we come to you today lifting up all those souls that are hurting, those souls that are, are wanting answers, those souls that are desiring peace within their world. We're offering up strength and courage as well as connection for all those who are, are experiencing the, this COVID. You know how desperately we want to connect with one another. And you provide us those opportunities within our lives. You, you give us that chance to see how we can connect with one another in new ways. So we want to pray for all those who are currently suffering. Bring somebody into their lives so that they know that you are still with them, that you have always been with them, and you will be with them. We want to raise up the Perkins family as they are experiencing the loss of a loved one. We want to lift up our neighbor, Jean Ann Tribblett, as she is continuing with, with her health. And we want to lift up the members of our nation who are seeking guidance and seeking the love and grace that, that only you can provide. Heavenly Father, send us your spirit so that the spirit may connect us, unifying us, so that we know that while we might be separating physically, spiritually, we are still one. One body and your family. One spirit and your love and grace. So Heavenly Father, we, we come to you today with a lot on our heart, but also knowing full well that when we come to you, you will bring us the grace that we so desire. So let us pray the prayer that you taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading today is an epistle reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us live in the light, be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other, build each other up, just as you are already doing. Thank you, Tom. 
Our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. And then he went on a journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not shown, sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I was, you knew that I harvest where I had not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold. He took the bag of gold from him, gave it to one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and whoever, whoever, and they will have an abundance. So whoever have, even though what they have will be, whoever does not have, even though they have what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worst servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God's word for the people of God. There's a story written by an unknown author I want to share briefly this morning. In that story, the author says, it was sitting by the side of the road, a busy two-lane highway, the church, with red brick walls and a white steeple pointing up to the heavens. It had been part of the landscape for decades, so long that those who traveled down the highway no longer noticed it was even there. They no longer noticed that every week the little white letters announcing the title of the sermon had been changed. Everything else seemed to stay the same, exactly the same, week after week after week. I decided to visit the little red church one Sunday morning. I stood at a distance and I watched the women and the men and the girls and the boys gather. It was hard to tell exactly why they were there. They didn't seem very happy about it. No one rushed to the door to see what might be awaiting them on the other side. Oh, there were some polite handshakes. 
They acknowledged each other's presence half-heartedly. I went in and found a place alone. They came in too. They seemed to know exactly where they would sit. They found their places without hesitation. I looked at the bulletin that described what would happen during that hour. I wondered if it was the same every week. The service began and I listened. I listened very carefully to the words that were spoken to each other and the words that were spoken to God. I learned a lot about these people this morning, more than they would have ever expected, perhaps even more than they even knew about themselves. I wanted to ask them why they were here, but in my heart I knew. I could see it in their faces. I could hear it in their voices. They were here simply because they thought God would be angry with them if they were not. The offering plates were passed. I didn't ask them why they dropped in their gifts. I knew if I had asked them why they give to the church, they would have said, God will be angry if we don't. They seemed to be very careful. They wanted to make sure they didn't give too much. Even the songs. Do you know how people sound when they're singing because they're afraid someone will be angry? don't. When the service was over, I left wondering, how do they do it? Where do they hide all the joy? I almost expected as I left the building to see the churchyard, in the churchyard, a huge hole in the middle of the well-manicured lawn. I could picture the church members in my mind every night under the cover of darkness, frantically digging with their little shovels this huge hole where they would bring all their wonderful gifts. The gifts God had given them and bury them. Afraid that if they let those gifts somehow, if they let them out, somehow things might change. How? Well, they weren't sure. But if things changed, God might be angry. I could see them digging and digging and digging, trying to keep their life together under control. It would take a lot of energy, I thought, to bury the bountiful gifts of God. No wonder they seemed so tired and so weary. And yet, I knew sadly that they would keep on digging, thinking that it was the only way to survive, thinking somehow that burying God's energy God's creativity, God's generous spirit would somehow make God very happy. I have several questions this morning I'd like to ask for all of us to ponder. Those of you who got our bulletin early uh, via email have those questions there in front of you in your bulletin. If you would like to have those who are watching at home that are not receiving our bulletin, just let us know. We'll be happy to put you onto the email list and, and send it to you. But there's five questions I want to start with this morning. What is God's purpose for your life? Second question, why did God give you life? Third question, why did God place you here? Fourth, what does God expect of you? And fifth, what gift or gifts did God give you and what are you doing with it to contribute to God's work? in the world. What's God's purpose for you? Why did God give you life? Why did God place you here? 
What does God expect of you? And what gift or gifts did God give you? And what are you doing with it to contribute to God's work in the world? I hope you'll ponder those questions, not only throughout this service this morning, but that you'll also ponder those questions throughout the day and perhaps even throughout the week. Spend some time with God thinking about all of those answers and arriving at a conclusion between you and God. Now Matthew 25 and Matthew 26, Matthew 25 contains three separate parables that Jesus told explaining what the kingdom of heaven was like. These are stories that resulted from a question that Jesus was asked by the disciples. Beginning in chapter 24, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? Jesus asked. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Last week, Pastor Tom preached on the parable of the ten virgins. Today I'm going to be preaching on the parable of the talents. But before we can fully understand the significance of those parables, we need to know that in chapter 24, Jesus is telling his disciples about end times, the end of the age. He went on in that chapter. <coughs> to tell them what those signs would be. And these are the things that are in Matthew 24, 5 through 11. The temple is going to be destroyed. Many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. Wars and rumors of wars will be rampant. Nation will rise against nation. Kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famines, there will be earthquakes, you will be persecuted and put to death. You'll be hated by all nations. Many will return from the faith. They will betray and hate each other. There will be false prophets. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. All of these things that Jesus talked about are going to happen before the return of Christ. And many of those things I'm sure we can look at and say many of them are taking place, have taken place. Evidently there's still more yet to come. But when we read chapters 24 and 25, we can't help but question our own salvation, can we? But it's not all doom and gloom. Because in the midst of chapter 24, verse 13 appears. And it says, but the one who stands firm will be saved. The one who stands firm will be saved. You know, there's hope in those who profess Jesus Christ as the Lord of life and stand firm in their faith to the end. In other words, those who are living according to, to God's word when will it happen? The disciples wanted to know. There's always a lot of doomsayers out there, people making all kinds of predictions. But Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 36, about that day or hour, no one knows. 
not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Chapter 25 talks about our need to be prepared. And there's three parables in that chapter. Three stories of who's acceptable and who is not. The first story is the one of the ten virgins which Pastor Tom preached last week. Those who work, those who make only a partial effort by doing the work of Jesus Christ. Those who try to slide by. Those who aren't sincere, they're just playing at religion. Those who anticipate they can slide in on someone else's apron strings. There are a lot of people living in the world today. As they have lived lots of life, as if living as if they had lots of life left. We're still young yet. It's a long time to live. I have too many fun things I want to do. I'll make a decision to follow Christ later. William Barclay says, there's a fable which tells of three apprentice devils who were talking to Satan, the chief of the, of the devils, about their plans to tempt and ruin mankind. The first said, I'm going to tell them there is no God. And Satan said, that will not delude many, for they already know there is a God. The second said, I'm going to tell men there's no hell. And Satan said, you will deceive no one that way. Men already know there's a hell for sin. The third said, I'm going to tell men that there's no hurry. And Satan said, oh, go ahead. You will ruin them by the thousands. You see, the most dangerous delusions is that there's a lot of time. The dangerous day is a, in a man's life is when he learns that there is no such word, that there is such a word as tomorrow. There are things which must not be put off for no man knows if for him or her tomorrow will even come. The second story in Matthew 25 is the parable of the talents. Making use of the talents that God has given to you and to me. And too often we think in terms of this parable being about financial gifts that we can give. But we all have a gift, and it's not talking about only financial. It's amazing how many people I have heard say, well, I don't have a gift. Well, Romans 6, Romans 12, 6 through 8 says, we all have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generosity, generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. You may not know what your gift is, but you do have a special gift, a special God-given gift that God expects you and me to use to further the work of his kingdom. This morning we read about the parable of the talents. The master going away called his servants together and gave one of them five bags of coin and to another he gave two and to a third he gave one. The one with five, the one with two invested and they brought back an equal amount, double the amount that the master had given them. But the third buried his and simply brought back the gift, basically saying, I was afraid. 
I didn't want to risk it. I'm reminded of a story that was told some years ago by Ellsworth Collis. It came from a book called uh, Parables from the Backside. Ellsworth, in, these, in this book, said he talks about a, the story of a farmer who asks, what are you going to plant this spring, Jake? Jake replies, and he says, what are you going to plant this, this year, Jake? Corn? And Jake replies, no, I'm scared of the corn borer. Oh, says the farmer, will you then plant potatoes? And Jake says, no, too much danger of potato bugs. The farmer is at a loss and said, well, what are you going to plant then? And Jake says, nothing. I'm going to play it safe. <clears throat> Scripture makes it very clear. If we don't use the gift that God has given us, we will lose it. So how are you using the gift that God has given you to further the work of God in this world and in the world to come. What are you going to do to further the work of God in our community, in, our, in, our, in your workplace, in our church? Are you putting your talent to work or are you burying it, counting on someone else to do what needs to be done? I see in this parable of the talents both a warning as well as a promise. A reminder that the use of our talents, our gifts, demonstrates our faithfulness to God. Have you ever thought about that? The use of our talents, whatever it is that God has given to you or God has given to me, is a sign of our faithfulness to God. It demonstrates it. God gives the gift. And he expects you and me to put it to good use. And when we don't, we are among the unfaithful servants mentioned in the parable from last week and in the parable from today. At a church I served some years ago, there was a small group discussion, and that discussion turned to evangelism. And one of the persons sitting around the table said, evangelism? Whoa, that's not my gift. And with that statement, he buried God's gift, the God-given talent, to share how God was at work in his life. That's the one thing you and I can all do. Share how God has made a difference in your life and in mine. We do that sometimes. Bury it. Bury the gift God offers, thinking it's that's not the gift I want to deal with, and perhaps something better will come along. But it's not the gift that's important, folks. It's what you and I choose to do with it. I also see a certain amount of uh, risk and responsibility in this parable. Why? Because we need risk takers in our churches. We need risk takers for Jesus. We need visionaries who, who offer themselves to him and allow him to use them and to help them. We need dedicated people. Otherwise, the work of Christ is not going to get done in this world. Our gifts can be simple. They can be very complex, they can, they can be visible, they can be behind the scenes, things that people don't even know we're doing. I love to hear the stories of before COVID. I love to go into the retirement homes and visit with our homebound and hear the stories of people who had been there before me. I didn't know they were doing that. I didn't know they were calling on them. People who were sending notes, cards, calling on the telephone saying, how are you today? 
you know, it's, I'd love to see the, to hear those stories of those who are working behind the scenes. Our gifts can come in all forms, from singing, playing an instrument, speaking, teaching, healing, offering hospitality, counseling, administration. But all have to be done with humility and love. We have to quit talking, speculating, analyzing, and thinking about the talents that he's given to you and to me, and we need to do something with them. It may be risky. There may even be times when we feel a little on the foolish side. But God's going to bless you, and he's going to give you more opportunities. Don't bury your opportunities. William McCumber, who was a United States diplomat, he was also the first president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, said, the reward of faithfulness is twofold, an increase in responsibility. Many of us have experienced that in the workplace, especially in those days when I was in the secular world the better job you do, the, the more responsibility you're given. But it's also true in the ministry. Because there are opportunities to serve that are, are coming that we maybe never saw. So it's an increase in responsibility. Secondly, there's an increase in joy. A joy that comes in the satisfaction that a good deed has been accomplished for Jesus Christ and for others. So yes, McCumber's right when he says it's, it's twofold. It's not an ecstatic, wide-eyed, spontaneous expression, but a, a deep, settled peace in the heart, he said. He says those willing to serve will be blessed in multiple ways. I started this morning with five questions. I'm going to end this message with those same five questions. Something for you and for me to ponder as we continue our journey through today and through the tomorrows of our lives. What were those questions? What is God's purpose for your life? What is his purpose for your life? Some of these may be questions you haven't even thought about before. But I hope you'll think about them this week. Why did God give you life? Why did God place you here? In this world? At this time? In this place? What does God expect of you? And then the final question. What gift or gifts did God give you? And what are you doing with it or with them to contribute to God's work in the world? Something to ponder. Something to give serious thought. It's kind of a hard message to hear today. And quite frankly, it's a hard message to preach today as well. But sometimes we just need to think about life. Think about our purpose in life. But the other side of that, when the end times come, we need to be ready. And what was that verse in 13? Those who stand firm, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. 
Stay strong in your faith. And may God be with you. Amen. Our closing praise hymn this morning. There is power. I have to admit, I'm not familiar with this particular praise song. I'm familiar with the hymn, but I'm not sure if it's exactly like the one we all know from the hymn or not, but we're going to give it a try. I, I wasn't here last week, and it, that was the first time that it was sung, and I, uh, so I'm kind of coming into this one without knowing for sure. So let's, let's join in. The, I'm a firm believer in, in the fact that whatever, whatever we sound like, God's going to make something beautiful. <laughs> so let's say our closing. Thank you for watching.
May you all go with the peace of God. In Christ's name, amen.